1956 was our year of change. Peter and I got married and moved to Trinidad. He just graduated from Leeds University with a BSc in Geology and had been offered a job as a field geologist in the oil fields of Trinidad. In our eight years there we came to love the place, especially its spectacular flora and fauna. In this talk we'll tell you how we came particularly interested in the island's butterflies and how this interest interwove with Peter's geological work. By the time we left in 1963, we had amassed the fourth largest collection of Trinidad butterflies in the world, along with extensive notes on our observations of their variations, behavioral patterns, and our collaboration with other numerous Lepidopterists, which our enthusiasm had developed and encouraged. We spent the three weeks of our honeymoon as supernumeraries on an empty oil tanker, ploughing through storms enough to break five of the ship's roofs. Finally arriving in November, within sight of Trinidad, we thought it was already Christmas, with the fairy lights shining right around the bay. The largest refinery in the southern hemisphere it was lit up in the evening light and made a welcoming sight. Next morning it was just as impressive. In 1956 Trinidad was still a British colony, situated just off the tip of Venezuela. This map shows the island with the mountains to the north and the oil fields to the south, starting with the marine drilling at Soldado, Forest Reserve, the principal field at that time, and Point Pier, our HQ, as well as a few other small leaseholds. The capital, Port of Spain, lay to the north, as did the best beaches. My employer, a British company, called Trinidad Leaseholds Limited, had bought leases to land in the southern part of the country with the right to drill for oil. My first assignment was as field geologist of Guayaguari oil field, an enormous but undeveloped area covering the bulk of the southeast. We were lucky enough to pick up a Super Austin Healy and set off for our new home. The field was managed from a small site comprising an office, clinic and houses for the staff. Our new home was up on the ridge, the first of 13 other houses along the top, and was surrounded by a variety of fruit trees, including two enormous avocado trees, all backing onto the jungle. We couldn't wait to get out and explore. What excited me about my new job was the potential for finding oil in the lizard area, which was the subject of an exploratory well currently being drilled. Oil in Guayaguari was not new, as wells had been drift to, drilled to exploit the potential of Lagon Bouf, a mud volcano venting petroleum gas as early as 1902 but they were poor producers and some were struggling to repay their cost. Trinidad has always been regarded as one of the hardest places in the world to get oil out of the ground. First to find it, then to drill it economically. Ten years previously this lease would have been sold if only they could have found a buyer. Now in 1956 the modern drilling and production methods were making the old barren sands yield undreamed of barrels of oil, and the refinery in Point of Pier was in the sterling zone which made it doubly profitable. 
There were three rigs drilling when I arrived, and my job was to supply the geological requirements of the drillers and the electric logging operators, and hopefully identify places where oil might be found. Oil normally occurs in porous layers, such as sand, or in cracks in limestone. However, in Trinidad, the fact that a layer has been found in one place does not mean it is easy to locate elsewhere. Trinidad's geology, described as slump-slip tectonics, is extraordinarily complex. In Miocene times it was a lake, but subsequent slipping and faulting have mashed up the layers. You could drill a well in the middle of four producing wells and it might come up dry. So my task was to try to predict spots with the best potential for finding oil. My primary tool was called a sand map, a map that extrapolated our best guess as to how the porous underground layers were folded and faulted. When I arrived, I inherited a collection of such maps and continued to update them. Our primary source of information was data gathered from existing wells. External contractors would lower a sensory probe down the well and then draw it up at an even speed, producing a chart of measurement by depth. A key metric was resistance, which indicated the porosity of the layers at that depth, although this could be confounded by other variables. Later, more sophisticated probes could provide data on radioactivity. On arrival in Guaguari, I was informed in passing, you'll have to make your own bread. Can't get any here, no shops. There's a lorry going into San Fernando once a month. You can give the driver a list of things he can pick up from Hilo's supermarket. The meat you can store in the company cold room. We each have a sack. If you want milk in your tea, you'll have to find someone with a cow and see if he will sell you some. The three-bedroom house was enormous, built of wood upon stilts, and with a gap between the top of the stairs and the floor, so as to discourage the neighbours. Instead of glass, the windows were covered with steel mesh to keep out the mosquitoes, and had canvas shields to come down in the event of a storm. Basic furniture was supplied. And what of you? And as the Austin Healy proved to have a dicky reverse gear, we swapped it for an MGA, again bright red, of course. I was somewhat mollified. In no time we became fascinated by the many butterflies flitting around our garden flowers. Then a large yellow would zigzag past at a most erratic flight. Why the different flight, and why didn't he stop to sup from the flowers? So many questions and no answers. Soon our curiosity overcame all else. We wanted answers. There were no books, but asking around, we did manage to find one publication. It seemed a Mr. K had come out in 1929 and become friendly with half a dozen locals who engaged a fleet of young boys to help them catch as many butterflies as they could find. From this he had compiled this booklet, giving us a technical description, but sadly no pictures. We took the book to pieces and added our notes and any from other people that we could find down the left-hand side. It so happened I'd made some guava jelly one morning and discarded the mushy seeds down at the bottom of the garden, which was also the fringe of the jungle. This fermented heap attracted a variety of insects I'd not seen before, including a completely different set of butterflies. An interesting zebra fascinated me, so I tried to entice him onto my finger. 
He, however, was so intoxicated he ceased to be frightened, instead flapping his wings angrily at my finger to chase it away. He was not going to share his booze with anyone. And just look at that for disguise. When Peter came for lunch, he dashed down to look and was lucky enough to find a purple emperor sitting supping this goo. Excitedly, he got into position and made a fast swipe, determined not to let this one fly away. Unbeknown to us, it was a slow woodland species, and his net mashed it to pieces, not even giving it time to take off. And so we learnt. Every day I would make up a fruit mash, adding a good slug of rum to it, before spreading it on every tree hollow I could find on a circuitous route, so that we could take regular trips round to see who was being tempted to a tipple. Trinidad rum, at five shillings a bottle, was known as the spirit of Trinidad, and we were happy to share it with the butterflies. Shh! Entrapment, really! You will be wondering about equipment here in the jungle with no shops. Well, a gentleman had spent one day at Peter's school teaching them about his butterflies and how he caught and studied them. The sum total of our knowledge was based on what he had told the boys on that one day. And so, before long, I was sewing mosquito netting onto logging wire and a broomstick. But we quickly realized butterflies were frightened by the pristine white net, so we soaked it in strong stewed tea to make it brown. That worked. This reminds me of the colleague who once asked to borrow one of our nets, and whose well-meaning wife actually put our net into her brand new twin tub washing machine before returning it to us. It cost us several more pots of tea to make it dirty brown again. I had been a keen model builder in my youth and recognised the balsa trees which grew freely around the oil field. We cut ourselves some branches, sliced these into planks out of which to make boards on which to pin out the insects. The demonstrator at my school had mentioned Watkins and Doncaster as being the supplier of much of his equipment. Imagine him remembering that. Anyway, a letter to them addressed just to England actually found them, good old Royal Mail, and yielded a catalogue from which, for starters, we promptly ordered headless steel pins. From then on, every spare moment was taken up with catching, pinning out and studying our ever-growing collection. Like other insects, butterflies have six jointed legs, a pair of antennae, three body parts and an exoskeleton. The three body parts are the chest, the thorax, the tail end, the abdomen, and the head. The six legs and the four wings are attached to the thorax. The thorax makes the wings and legs move because it contains the muscles. The eggs hatch into caterpillars which break out of their skins into new larger ones about four times until it's fully grown. Then they attach themselves with threads they spin to a branch, though this again varies with the different species as they turn themselves into a pupa. This again differs till they suddenly break out, pumping the fluid out of their, their bodies and around their concertinaed wings until they drop and eventually dry stiff. Only then can they fly. They cannot eat, but get nourishment in liquid form, sucked through their long proboscis which is kept curled under their faces. They have two sets of eyes. The simple eye is more to determine light and dark, but it doesn't focus very well. 
The other eyes, 12,000 of them, are compound and used as their main eyesight. The males have scent gland with which to attract their females, but these again take many different forms. Nature itself and good old-fashioned observation taught us much. I well remember the time I was about to catch a small butterfly on a white flowering eupatorium, when a white, beautifully disguised spider suddenly shot up between the flowers and captured it from right under my nose. Having injected it into submission, the spider retreated to find another, and I stole his butterfly away from him. What excited me about the assignment was being there at the beginning of it all. The test well of the trial was drilled just a month before we arrived. By Christmas, twenty wells would have been drilled, and if plans went to schedule, another forty should have been drilled by March the following year. In fact, things were proving so successful that there was talk of five hundred in the following years. A sudden outcrop would test a vast untried area which showed great promise. If that came in, the sky could be the limit. All this testing was at that time being done by one shallow rig. In the northern part of the lease, I had another exploration well, looking for deep-seated oil, and this rig was due to drill seven or eight tests in various parts of the Guaguiari lease. I also had a new area in the old beech field that was showing promise. Nine wells had been drilled there for a total cost of $550,000 six months before and had already paid for themselves. When Texaco took over from Trinidad leaseholds, they also acquired interest or ownership of several other companies, and one, Antilles, had a big lease that was due to be explored when the takeover became effective. The oil field was very large, yet had been little worked in the past. This might possibly mean I would gain an assistant as well as drafting staff, and there was a strong possibility that this field, which would then be almost half of the southeastern quarter of Trinidad in area, would grow into one of the most important. I had arrived at just the right time, as all this made the job very exciting for me. Very good too for a beginner in the field of geology though if truth be told my job soon covered a wide variety of facets. This meant I travelled all over the vast area, very good for finding new butterflies, while I waited for the driller to call. Peter proved himself the expert at thinning the creatures out, so I left that side of it to him, while I concentrated on making the labels of where and when each insect was caught, and putting the dried insects into the correct drawers. Much to his delight, Peter discovered that my little insect, which had been injected by the spider, remained nice and supple for over 48 hours. We found butterflies normally had to be pinned out within 12 to 16 hours before their muscles set hard, and the wings could no longer be moved without breaking. I must confess we had no further compunction in stealing any insect from the hapless spiders. Wished we knew the magic mixture so that we could inject it into the creatures ourselves. One of my interesting challenges was when occasionally we took a core sample. This involved the driller pulling all the pipe out of the hole and stacking it in 60 or 90 foot lengths in the drilling tower in order to change the solid bit at the end of a tubular one. This leaves a solid column of rock, the core, that fills a special tube attached to the new bit. One has then to pull all the pipe back out of the hole to recover the sample. This expensive process is used to get more information 
about the characteristics of the oil reservoir, such as its density, porosity, viscosity, and percentage of oil. This influences profitability and investment potential, and so affects decisions such as whether to employ secondary recovery, such as pumping water into deeper wells to force more oil up towards the surface. Naturally, this could be ready for me to examine at any time of the day or night and had to be ready to drop everything when the driller called for me. Butterflies had peace for a while. Betty said she had never likened the ground beneath her feet as a layered cake, yet studying my maps one could have a nice layer of sand with a layer of impervious shale on top of it, allowing the oil to soak into the sand. If the layer cake is slightly folded, then the oil will collect at the top of the fold, leaving the lower part full of salty water. Such layers could be repeated further down. My job was correlating the sand shown in different wells and drawing contour maps on the different layers. Each time a well was drilled, an electric logging company was called in to make a record of the layers encountered in that well, and sometimes it was difficult to tie up the layers if faulting had occurred between those wells, or a sand may have faded out. Betty became fascinated when looking at the microscopic fossils which came up with the cause. These minute shells could be different with each layer and could just help me with the correlation. Draw 1. There are 24 drawers laid out with one male followed by his female, then another male upside down followed by a female also upside down. It has long been a grouse of ours that museums do not show enough undersides, which often show great variations. We start with the family Danidae, of which the monarch is the most highly developed of the species. I say this because they are very poisonous, which they get from eating the milkweed plant as a caterpillar. Its bright colour warns other creatures of this fact, and should one eat a monarch, it will make them very sick and can lead to kidney failure, even in a human. These butterflies appear to only have four legs, the two front pair having become quite atrophied and seem only to be used to wash their faces. Here you can see on the male two dark scent glands, but it takes different forms on different species. In our next subfamily you can see the unusual aberration of the tiger, parts of its coloration missing. We had hoped to name him, but then discovered someone had already found a similar happening in South America. Because we were catching in jungle, the way we identified the place was by marking the number of the well drilled there. And we have a map with all the wells marked on it. Thus most of our insects have a little label telling exactly where and when it was caught. That is, unless we bred it ourselves. Each butterfly has its story, but to tell all would take all night, so I'll just pick out the most memorable as, for instance, these two transparent species. The first is found in the lowlands, while the second, with more white on its tip, could only be found over a thousand feet. Oh yes, we explored all over the island. Before we leave this drawer, I must tell you about this little black and yellow fellow. Area Agna Looking up at a high bank one day, we saw the tip of a black and yellow wing sticking out over the edge of a leaf. Thinking it was Arium or a relative, Peter determined to climb up the muddy Stimawi bank and try and catch it. 
Scratched and bleeding, he got to just below the bush, stuck his net up near it, and I shouted out which direction he should swipe. He did, and much to our delight, caught the insect. But in doing so, he slid all the way down the slope to the gully at the bottom. Timawi is a sticky plant with backward-facing harpoon-like thorns all the way down its clinging strands, and Peter was well and truly entangled in this vine-like plant. But the black and yellow wings were still inside the net. It took me nearly twenty minutes to carefully ease the harpoons out of his skin. For him it mattered not, he had caught his quarry. Just imagine his disappointment, however, on further examination, to find it was a daylight-flying moth, and not a butterfly at all. With three rigs drilling twenty-four hours a day, drillers came in shifts. When they get to the right depth, they had to know whether to stop or not, and decide whether to pull up the bit. They needed me to take samples of the cutting to find out if they were still in the sand or to decide whether to stop or run a bit further and take logs. The cost of running a rig meant they could not pause. Consequently, I was on 24 hours standby seven days a week. This tended to hamper our search for butterflies, so if we were in the jungle, we had to phone in every two hours to make sure I was not wanted. Remember, this took place long before mobile phones, so field phones had been attached to trees at intervals along the main roads. By turning the little wheel fast, the exchange was alerted that a message was coming in. One spoke into a small funnel while holding the old-fashioned receiver to one's ear. There was always someone on duty at the exchange, and she also had communication with Point of Pier, the headquarters. However, this rarely worked because in Trinidad lives a certain beetle who loves lead and would eat into the phone cables. Next time the rain came down, water would short out all communication, so exchange also had a, a citizen's band radio. Sadly, the valves didn't last long, and communication was often dismal. Came the day I became so frustrated I ran out into the yard and yelled at the top of my voice, Point of Pier, can you hear me? <laughs> On urgent occasions, I would even drive to the highest peak and attempt to contact the next field on the Land Rover radio, so a message could be relayed from field to field till it eventually reached Point of Pier. Heliconius Eurydes, or Postman, as it's locally called, with a large red spot on its top wing, appears identical to the coffee postman further down. When viewed, however, under ultraviolet light, the spots are completely different. Butterflies see things in ultraviolet and will not mate with the other species. In fact, some experiments were done painting those spots in different colors as soon as the insect hatched but the males then completely ignored the females, proving color was important to them for identification. Heliconius doris doris is particularly interesting, but only as a result of breeding them ourselves from caterpillars found in the bush and watching them hatch from their pupa. You see, all three colors came out of the same batch in more or less equal numbers, the red, blue, and green, though I see the latter has become paler over time. Green seems to be an unstable color in butterflies. As you can imagine, with several wells drilling at the same time, each liable to call on Peter without warning, we did not leave the field very often. The mishap gave us several hours free as the other well happened also to be pulling pipe in order to change the worn-out drill bit. 
we quickly ran the dentist, who, aware of our problem in getting free time, offered to give up his lunch break if we would come right away. It was a two-hour drive, so we hopped into the car and took off. However, on the way, we suddenly came upon a silver bush shimmering in the sunlight. It was covered in these flambeaux, supping on the flowers, its silver underside shimmering in the sunlight. We slammed on the brakes and jumped out with our nets. Needless to say, we arrived very apologetic, twenty minutes late. But when we showed the dentist our catch, he forgave us exclaiming at their beauty. Got his own back, though, finding I had eighteen fillings needed doing. Not all in one day, I'm happy to say, but in batches of five. Ouch! I once watched a female flambeau lay 247 eggs on one bush. It took her two and a half hours. Draw 3. Contains most of the common little butterflies constantly flitting around the lawn and the flower beds everywhere. As a result, most have common names such as donkey eye, tomato, fan, coolie, biscuit, etc. It was these butterflies which got us started. You might also notice the painted lady which many of you will recognize from your own gardens here in the UK. It seems to be distributed almost worldwide. You will also notice two green species, which here in the draw have a certain similarity. In character and habits, however, they couldn't be more different. The lower one, the bamboo parsh, is a slow and beautifully disguised creature flitting around the bamboo. However, the metamorpho dido at the top of the draw flies very fast and always high, zooming down forest trails, making it almost impossible to catch, and leaving us saying, I think that was. We happened to be strolling down such a trail once, when two were fighting, noisily, alerting us to their presence. As they came towards us, and by quickly extending our sticks as high as we could, each insect crashed into our nets, to our great joy and their discomfort. It settled their fight once and for all, though. The Blue Basin Banana Estate Biscuit, that's our nickname, was a butterfly we'd never caught and got very excited about when we saw it in someone else's collection. It happened like this. As we became known throughout the island as them that does catch butterflies, we had youngsters asking if we could identify their little collection. Not only did it enable us to get more people enthusiastic about the island's beautiful butterflies, but every now and then we would find an insect we didn't know. Fortunately, the lad remembered finding it at Piaco, the airport. It was time we explored the northern range with its ex estates of coffee and cocoa, sheltering safely in the shade of the enormous immortel trees. The long modern airport was impressively developed along the front, but the back was a field of flourishing bushes on open ground, part of the banana estate. On arrival, we saw our first orange butterfly just as the rain came down. Within seconds, every insect had disappeared. Nothing daunted, we none ruthlessly shook each bush in turn so as to disturb them, and one precious butterfly came out. Off Peter rushed only to discover the ground was a swamp as he splashed his way between the bushes. It wasn't long before I too had joined in the chase. Rain continued, but we didn't have long, so we continued the hunt. 
It was when I slipped and sat down in a puddle that I noticed the entire length of the airport with its many large windows was a sea of faces watching those two idiots running around in the rain. Most perplexing for them, no doubt. At the top are the crackers, so-called, because they're forever flying around each other, making a loud noise like someone eating crisps. You can hear them while sitting inside the room. The first time we met the stunning King Cracker, he was sitting at waist height on a large tree. This is one of the few butterflies which does not sit with its wings upright, but instead sits with its wings wide open, lying flat, the same as a moth does. It makes for perfect disguise. Very excited, Peter crept forwards towards the trunk, ignoring the nettles and the harpoons of the Timawi. But as he tensed his muscles about to swipe, the butterfly calmly walked around to the other side of the huge trunk. Ignoring the blood, he crept round to the other side of the tree for the same thing to happen. The butterfly walked back around to my side. Stay there and get ready, I whispered, as I struggled to step quietly forward through the undergrowth. This time, as I tensed to swipe, Beta was ready for him and niftily caught him as he walked back around the trunk away from me. One surprised king, too clever by half. Below the crackers are some very rare butterflies. As you can see, we are still missing the second male. In fact, there is a third species, unnamed at that time, and only seen once by us, but unfortunately not caught. It always amazed me just how different these males are from their females. Smyrna Bomfridia was another such rare and fascinating specimen, this being the only one we managed to catch. It has, to us, a beautiful underside, though to a butterfly it is the top which has the beauty, the underside being but its disguise against the foliage. Lastly, at the bottom of the drawer, we find Hippolymnus Misipus, whose female is mimicking the poisonous Danidae of the first drawer, while its male is more like the previous group in this drawer. Incidentally, my baby son learnt and loved to say Hippolymnus Misipus as one of his first words, dumbfounding visitors, but spoilt it by pointing to any butterfly which happened to be passing. In this drawer we have the cheeky little zebra which I mentioned before. Below it the Megalura, colloquially known as the tailed flambeau, that amazed me by having those long tails which complete its replica of the twig on a leaf. What a perfect disguise! Both are on this tree. See if you can find them. This tailed flambeau was seen as a swarm near Sapira district, moving in an easterly direction, and was so large a swarm that it took them three days to pass. The little dynamine group in the middle of this drawer has always fascinated me, as it's a perfect example of a male completely different from his female yet the undersides are identical. In drawer 6, all the butterflies are fruit eaters, and as you can see from their undersides, they blend very well with dead leaves, so tend to disappear when supping on the fallen fruit. Here I should mention how useful the map of wells proved to be. Every time a new well was drilled, the crew would be there for several weeks, and as they brought their lunches with them, they tended to throw the large mango seed, or the citrus, lychees, and other fruit seeds out around the edges of the clearing. By the time the crew moved on, 
these seeds were sprouting a ring of fruit trees amongst the jungle plants. This was ideal for us. We loved the jungle, quiet and peaceful, yet never silent, with birds and strange creatures calling to each other, or the occasional troop of howler monkeys throwing sticks at us, voicing their disapproval of our invasion of their territory. Over it all would come the gentle sounds of someone tuning a steel pan down in the valley, or, if we were lucky, a band practicing for their next event. Trinidad was amazing in that anything you planted immediately sprouted and grew, even if it was upside down when put in the ground. With 90 degrees Fahrenheit most of the time and 90% humidity, what more could plants want? Frequent short bursts of showers kept the ground moist and had us dashing for the nearest banana leaf for shelter. Surveyors had a lot of trouble in that the stakes they stuck in the ground to mark their way had all grown into trees within six months. As a result, they took to putting in only copper beech stakes. This group of Nymphalidae were introduced to us by some hunters when they guided us up to the top of the Trinity Hills in Guaraguari. On the way they showed us many useful plants, including the water vine, which must be cut very quickly in two places so as to capture the water within the length of tube. And very nice it was too. Just pure, cool, fresh water, with no unpleasant taste to it. The top of the hill had a flat area about the size of a football pitch, surrounded by tall trees, blocking all view of the sea or the rest of the jungle. The snag for us was that when I spotted a butterfly on a branch, it was some twenty feet away from the edge of the hill. But if I went down to the foot of the tree, then the butterfly was some twenty feet up in the branches. The solution was for Peter to climb the tree until within reach of the butterfly, slowly extending his net while I directed him from the top. Two o'clock. No, a bit further to your left. Right, now. Swipe towards ten o'clock. Amazingly, he got it in the net most times. Now came the job of climbing back down while holding the net closed. By the end of the day, we were well pleased with our new finds, but perplexed at the enormous variation within one species. Unfortunately, we couldn't stay long, as it was soon to turn dark, and we were a thousand feet up the mountain. Time to hurry on down before we could no longer see the way. The jungle is no safe place to be in the dark. I must add that by now we began having difficulty identifying some specimens. Two solutions followed. First, we traced and visited each of the five collections built up at the time of Mr. K's visit in 1929. Unfortunately, most had been inherited by relatives ignorant of how to continue preserving the insects but we managed to identify and name or check most of our collection. The few specimens that defeated us I painted, and we sent to Mr. K, who kindly went to the museum for details. Peter built me an epidioscope out of an old cardboard box with some special lenses from an enlarger. It worked well. On returning to the UK, we actually met Mr. K and his charming wife and were able to study his personal collection. The proponer, or colloquially known as the shoemakers, are very fast and therefore very difficult to catch. On a lucky day, we might find one or two on rotting fruit, but even then, they are up and away before our net can come even near them. Very beautiful, graceful, with iridescent blue flashes, 
they attracted attention everywhere, though most people thought that they were birds. On hatching, they gather at any convenient puddle and flush water through their system before flying off. There are several species we saw doing that. All the tops are the same bar one, and we could only tell the various subspecies from their underside. Another example of the necessity to see the underside. Yes, we unearth one puzzle in that the males of Laertes, or purple sh shoemaker, has bright purple on his top. On the other hand, we caught more of this subspecies where the males had no purple. We were unable to determine whether these males had the same females or if they were a different species, or what was the difference between them. Maybe in the meantime some institution somewhere has been able to sort out this puzzle. But to date we've not heard the answer. Draw number 8 contains the well-known blue morpho, from which brooches and pictures are made in South America. The Trinidad subspecies are, however, very different in that they have a broad black border. We have been called fanciful and all sorts of uncomplimentary names by those who feel they know everything about Lepidropter when we tell them that under fruit trees deep in the jungle we frequently came across the morpho feeding on fallen fruit but the males appear to sit around the edges of the circle and were quick to rise flying over the females in the middle and dipping over them before flying on, as if to warn them of danger. Incidentally, if Peter was wearing a blue shirt, these butterflies would detour, circling around him before flying on. Guess his pheromones were not to their liking. We even experimented with blue paper on the ground, and again they took a good look before flying on. One of our initial ventures into the jungle yielded our first blue morpho. In trying to get him into the killing bottle, that gorgeous butterfly got away. I was bitterly disappointed, so much so that when a moth struggling to fly laboriously by, I caught it and told Peter that as punishment he had to pin it out. But he had the last laugh, for when he did so, he discovered it was a stunningly beautiful little butterfly with gold drops on its wings. Its top was plain brown, but oh, that underside! The last straw was that Peter had to pull a couple of strands of my hair with which to pin it out. This draw also contains our prized possession, Dynasto Darius Darius. This butterfly was actually resting on the wall inside my office on Christmas Eve. Only one other such had been caught in 1929, but no one knows its normal habitat or anything else about it. Naturally, I had no net, but managed to grasp its fake body between my fingers, and ten minutes later the only other butterfly catcher on the field walked in. Excitedly, I phoned Betty to tell her about it, and could she bring the colleague bottle. We pinned it out upside down because of its beauty, and because the top side is plain black, but for that tiny white triangle on its top wing. The drive to Guayaguari was very beautiful, with miles of graceful coconut trees lining the road along the edge of the beach. They did not escape unscathed, however, this coconut pest being its main enemy. Mother-in-law said it was her dream to live in this cove. That was until I told her it was infested with some of the largest and most ferocious mosquitoes that I had ever encountered, and the river was full of alligators. There are many different palms in Trinidad, and when the company decided to drill on Galeota Point, 
it had to seek permission to cut down a few of the protected king palms in order to build the road suitable to carry the heavy drilling rig out to the point. These palms are delicious eating, but as it is the top and the new leaves which are so tender and sweet, it invariably kills the tree. A new pink orchid was discovered there, but unfortunately no new butterfly species. Though the point was later a quiet place for Peter to practice his cornet without disturbing any neighbours, at the foot of the promontory was what became known as the aircraft carrier, a slab of rock, and to give you an idea of its size, there's a man standing at the end of it. It also opened a view of the two beaches we enjoyed most of the time on our own our fellow workers preferring the bar. One of the most hated and feared trees was this untidy palm with all its dead fronds. As you can imagine, one of the big dreads on an oil field was fire, and these, once burning, exploded, shooting out burning fronds right across any road or fire barrier. An interesting palm is the traveller's palm, so called because its fronds form a large V which traps water. After about 18 months in Guaguiari, I was promoted to the Barrack 4 oil field, where my enhanced status qualified us for a stone house. Betty was infuriated, but it was a status symbol and went with the job. The brick buildings were nothing like so cool as the wooden ones, and sitting on the ground invited hordes of unfriendly insects to share our living space. For me, there was a new field dubbed Rock Dome. About this time, reports were coming in that wells in the Middle East producing 3,000 barrels an hour. In neighbouring Lake Maracaibo, Venezuela, one could expect about 300 barrels an hour while in poor old Trinidad the average was about 30 barrels if you were lucky. Fortunately, the Crown Royalties were only about 10%, so a shallow well could expect to pay for itself in weeks instead of hours. This then was my new life, looking after shallow wells on a tight grid that were being logged almost as soon as they'd run the surface casing. There was a different lot of butterflies in this area, and we soon met a surveyor, who also had done a bit of collecting. Identifying his insects, we were astounded to find Papilio lycrophon, which had not been seen since Mr. K was collecting. Where had he found it? We scoured the area where he had been working at that time without success, until one day he phoned us to report that they were flying again. That weekend, every lepidopterist in the country was at Paryland to catch, except us. We had a date in Port of Spain to collect Betty's parents off the ship, so it was another year before we had one in our collection. They only flew annually for three weeks down that particular trail, and shows how vital habitat preservation is. Barrackpool Field lay in the middle of the sugarcane growing area, and another place involved with fire, though not so dangerous to the field. You see, each farmer was allocated a specific day on which to bring his harvest to the factory, for it has to be processed within 48 hours of cutting. Unfortunately, a jealous rival could set fire to your field, upon which you had to take it to the factory and beg them to process it immediately, at a reduced price, of course. Trains pulled wagon loads of cane to the factory with special gathering places to which the farmers brought their harvest in bullock carts. An interesting observation. Cain attracted snakes and scorpions in large numbers. When a European was stung by a scorpion, he had to quickly eat about a pound and a half of sugar, 
and he would feel little effect. If, however, an Indian was stung, he almost invariably died, and as the fields were worked by Indians, brought years before as indentured labor, this was a serious thing. Was it his DNA, or diet, or what? Surely this was crying out for further research. Here we have the calico, who is also known as the owl, and when upside down you can see why. Colloquially also known as the six o'clock, because it only flies at dawn or dusk, when its coloration blends perfectly. Many butterflies have certain times of the day when they fly, and after ten in the morning, for instance, you will see a completely different set foraging from the ones that were there before. The caligo glides silently past, landing to sup off the fallen fruit at your feet. There are three subspecies, one only found amongst the trees, while the other habitats the cane fields, and the third frequents the cocoa plantations to the north. The big eye provides a lot of protection, keeping bolder creatures snapping at the wrong end, thinking that was the head. As in some other cases, we were able to extrude two eggs from the female caligo. Caligo minor, or caligo morbleau, as the local name calls it and the whole history of their hatching, to pupating, and finally emerging as a perfect male butterfly, was recorded. It took a total of 63 days. This drawer also contains the purple emperor, which we saw before. How different is his female! Talking of false eyes and frightening devices, let me digress a moment and show you the lantern bug, much favoured by the witch doctors and said to contain magic powers. It has a row of portholes along the length of its false head. If I approached him with a stick, he backed away, but if I teased him with a tiny twig, pretending to be a tiny creature, he would suddenly lunge at me flap his wings and flash lights through the portholes. He was quite scary. The Satyridae are low-flying butterflies, mostly brown, maybe with a little blue, and rather dull, but for the Queen of the Night, and the Cravat, their names, perhaps, making up for the dullness of the family. The next draw in the late 1960s and 70s, I was continually invited to talk at schools and other institutions. This is the drawer I was sure to take with me, the top half being daylight flying moths, which continually caught us out, making us nearly break our necks to catch them. Mention butterflies to the locals and they cite this beautiful iridescent fellow with the white tails, which, of course, is not a butterfly at all. Some of the top ones frequented the river banks and were so fast they were mistaken for birds. Some look as though they could, could sting you, but they can't really. The second half of the draw contains the little 89 and the BD, both diligent pupils. Oh, the children loved that. At class one day, the science teacher pointed to the window, told the class of ten-year-olds to come and see this pretty butterfly. My son was amongst them, turned to teacher, pointing out that it was not a butterfly but a moth, and proceeded to explain how it didn't have a clubbed antenna, but rather a feathered one. It didn't close its wings upwards when it came to rest, and besides its scales were long and thin, giving it a furry look. Fortunately, Teacher was not put out, but asked where he had learnt all that, and so she found out about our collection, and followed it up with an invitation for me to bring some of our drawers and tell the school all about them. 
Last of all is the street Arab, discovered in Malcolm Barkant's collection. He told us that he and his friend Frank Ambard used to catch them on the third crossing of the little stream coming down Mount Hololo, but that had been fifteen years previously. Would they still be there? We got halfway up the mount after a hair-rising climb in our MGA, with me sitting on the boot to keep the back wheels touching the ground. At the first crossing we abandoned the car. There were no special butterflies. At the second crossing there was not a single street Arab to be seen, though the vegetation was alive with wings of all sorts fluttering around us. We laboriously climbed further, and there, at the third crossing of the trail, we found them. There were dozens of street Arabs all over the place, both male and female. Imagine it, after fifteen years, they were still confined to the same little place and nowhere else. That brings us to the end of the first set of drawers, and time for tea, before we continue with Peter's marine drilling, the papillos, and the stunningly beautiful Ericinidae. <laughs> 